for worship time together. So Psalm 4 says this, starting verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be returned to shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your own beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I'll both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, God, for who you are. And God, I just pray as we get into this time of worship, Father God, that our, our hearts would reflect that. Um, God, that this time would be a, a time for us pouring out our hearts to you in response to who you are and what you've done for us. And so God, I just pray that this moment would be a moment where uh, all attention, all focus, um, God, all energy is directed towards you. Um, God, that we would not be distracted or be distracting to those around us. But God, that we truly enter into a time of worship in this moment, God, that is glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's up, guys? Um, my name's Taylor. I just want to invite you guys to stand. We're going to be singing a new song called Adonai. Um, Adonai is just another word for God. Um, and this song is just talking about how much mercy God has on us. And one of the lines that I feel like has really stuck with me listening to this song, uh, it says, I promise you I will not waste your time thinking of ways to clear my name. And I think it's so easy for us to do that. I think a lot of times I feel like I, I can earn my salvation or earn God's love, but the the best thing is that we don't have to earn anything from God. It's just the mercy is given to us. So let's sing about that. I promise you I will not waste your time thinking of ways to clear my name. Oh, I deny have mercy on me. If you're still listening to me, there's only one thing that I need now. Oh, I deny, have mercy on me. Because I got nothing to bring. Yeah, I got nothing to bring. I know I question, know I doubt. Don't always hear when you call out to me. Oh, I deny how mercy. If you're still up there looking down, there's only one thing that I need now. Oh, I deny have mercy on me now. Cause I got nothing to bring. I got nothing to bring Cause I got nothing to bring No, I got nothing to bring You, I will not waste your time thinking of ways to clear my name. Oh, I deny, have mercy on me. I deny, have mercy on me. I deny, have mercy on me.
love is eroding Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain Beyond the horizon Mercy for today Faithful you have been and Faithful you will be yourself to me and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you father the orphan your kindness makes us whole you shoulder our weakness becomes our own you're making me like you clothing me white bringing beauty from ashes you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame known by her true name and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, you will be praised, you will be praised. Angels and saints, so we sing, worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints, so we sing, worthy are you, Lord. And it's why I sing, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips so this next song is so will i and it basically just truly hones in on how God has done so much for us and has, has just worked so much in our lives and has done everything for us. And how can he do all of this? And how can he be our savior, have done everything for us, have created us, be our creator, and we do nothing else to worship him? It says that if the stars were made to worship, so will I. If everything that God has designed and created is made to worship the Lord, then so shall we be worshiping him. So that's basically what this song is about. Um, let's get into another time of worship. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and flashed out the wonder of light. And as you hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath the planets roll The stars are made to worship so light I can see your heart in everything you've made If you burn and start a signal fire of God 
of your promise You don't speak in vain No syllable empty or void For once you have spoken On nature and science Follow the sound of your voice And as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath Evolving in the pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature so bright I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky a of your plan. Creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow and rip, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For with everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the song of all her praises still falls shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. Oh, whoa. Jesus, just during this time, let us all come together and just praise and worship how awesome you are and how great of a creator and how great of a Lord you are. During this message, let our ears be willing to hear and understand what you have for us and what you have planned for us. Through Jared's message and through his speaking and through you coming through him, Help us learn more about what you have for our lives and the will that you have for us to complete. 
I pray for small groups and the rest of our nights and the rest of our weeks that we can constantly just keep our eyes on you and worshiping you. Amen. Amen, amen. Go ahead and take a seat, everybody. Worship team, thank you guys so much. How is everybody doing tonight? We doing good? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, we continue in 1 John tonight, and so you'll notice there are some Bibles um, either near you or on your chair, so make sure you guys grab one of those because we're going to be jumping into that in a second. Um, but tonight's topic is going to be uh, a familiar one, uh, and tonight we're going to be talking about love. So um, love, uh, believe it or not, is uh, one of the most popular um, ideas or concepts or desires that everybody has. Uh, when I was uh, getting this ready, I, I did some, some Googles, and Google assumes or believes that there are over 100 million songs written about love. And according to Google, about 60% of all songs ever made have to do with love. And so I was like, well, what is the most popular love song, right? And so I was trying to find, what, what do you think? No. We're going, we're going a little further back. Now, I'll be honest. It was hard to find a consensus number one song. Uh, what do you think? No. But that's all. See? See, we're, we're already, you know, we're not quite sure. This song that we're going to, to listen to in just a second, just a brief snippet of it, is probably one you've heard, might not, you know, think about, but it has over, wait for it, one billion plays just on YouTube alone. So, um, all right, last guess. Whitney Houston. Oh, you, all right, go ahead and play it. Go ahead and play it. Feel free to sing along as you hear it. <laughs> this is one of those ones where you just, you know, want to, with your friend, just, you know, rock and maybe pull out the, the light or the light, right? So raise your hand if you heard this song before, whether it's in a movie or just somewhere and you didn't really you didn't realize what the song was but now you know right all right so that is uh, probably one of the most popular love songs ever written and here's what I want us to to think about tonight as, as we get into this is there's a lot of people that have heard that song a lot of people are familiar with that song and I think one of the reasons why there's over a hundred million love songs written because whether we realize or not, at our deepest human level, every single one of us desires to be loved. Like that is a natural human desire that's been instilled in us that we have. Now, maybe you desire to be loved by your dog. Uh, maybe you desire to be loved by your friends. Maybe someday you desire to be loved by a future spouse, um, by siblings, by that random person at school you've never talked to, probably never will talk to, but you love them, you want them to love you back. Whatever it is, right? Love is a natural human desire for us to have. And whether you want to admit it or not, uh, deep down, you desire to be loved. But what we don't all desire to do is to love other people. That our desire to love far supersedes our desire to actually give love to other people. We want to be loved more than we actually want to love other people, let's be honest, some people are very hard to love, right? People are difficult, people are hard. Uh, loving people costs us something. It can be messy, uh, it can be hurtful, all those things, right? We all want love, but we're all pretty hesitant sometimes to, to give love out because we don't want to be hurt. But what I want us to, to think about tonight is for, for those of us in the room uh, that consider yourself a Jesus follower, Loving others is something that we have to do. And if you're not a Jesus follower, um, reality for you is you need to love other people as well because Jesus sets the standard for us. And whether you don't want to follow him or not, that's, that's up to you, which is fine. Um, but one day, whether willingly or unwillingly, you are going to bow at the name of Jesus. And so my recommendation is 
Do it willingly, because it's going to happen eventually whether you want it to or not. And so uh, what I want us to begin to think about tonight as we get into this is our defining characteristic as followers of Jesus is always going to be how we love other people. It's not going to be your church attendance. It's not going to be your camp attendance. It's not going to be your community service. It's not going to be your mission trips. It's not going to be how much you give. It's not going to be whether or not you, you know, do things. It's, it's going to be the way you love other people. And so what we're going to look at tonight in 1 John chapter 3, you guys can open your Bibles there. We're going to look at four different realities when it comes to relationships with other people and four things that are present. And, and one of these things is going to sound outrageous, I know, but you're going to have to bear with me. And so the four things we're going to look at tonight are this. It's love, indifference, hatred, and murder. That those are the four broad categories that will define every single one of your relationships. You're either going to approach relationships or friendships with love, with indifference, with hatred, maybe not actual murder, but um, a hateful heart is a murderous heart as we're going to see tonight. And so that's where we're going. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into John, or 1 John chapter 3, starting verse 11. Let me pray. Father God, as we get into your words tonight, Lord, I just pray that you would just instill in us God, this desire to love others the way, Father, you have loved us to the person of Jesus. God, I just pray that the sacrificial love of Jesus would be so captivating to us, God, that we couldn't help but want to love others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18 says this. For this is a message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If by anyone, or but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And so if you've been with us uh, as we've gone through this first John series, you're, you're going to recognize the, the wording in that first verse, right? This, this idea of in the beginning, right, from the beginning you've heard this message. And so this is kind of a central theme to this letter that John is writing, this idea of, of loving our brothers, loving our sisters, loving those around us. So John's saying you, you've heard from the very beginning that the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus, the message of who Jesus is and what he's done is a message that's rooted and founded upon and built upon love. And so what John then does is he then lays out if, if that is the message we've heard, if that is the foundation for the gospel, he then tells us we should not be like something. And here's what he says, look in verse 12. Because the message is love, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So if you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, this is the story of the very first siblings found in Genesis 3. Or Genesis 4, 3 through 5, and here's what it says. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the grounds, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So we see here that, that Cain murders his brother Abel because of his anger that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not his. And so one of the first things that, that we see in, in this passage, in the very beginning of the Bible, is what jealousy can lead to. Now obviously, um, I hope that you have never wanted to, to murder your sibling over something they did. Uh, maybe you thought about it for a quick second and realized a uh, bad idea. Um, or maybe a friend or someone at school. But I bet we can all relate to the truth 
that there's probably that one person in your class, kind of let's just call them teacher's pet, right, that always gets every answer right, can never do anything wrong, and you just, you just can't stand that person, right? Or maybe you have the sibling who, no matter what happens, can never do wrong in the side of your parents, and you're just like, no matter what I do, I'm always wrong, and you kind of end up despising that person, right? Or maybe for you, it's, it's on some sort of team you're on, and there's that one person, that one player that everybody on the team um, despises, because no matter what happens, that person is the coach's favorite player or person, right? Now, let's be honest, uh, you might not want to necessarily murder that person, but there's a probably a good chance that you have some bit of animosity or even jealousy towards that person. That, that there is something within you that doesn't like that person simply because they do things better than you. Because if we're honest, if we, if we really want to think about it, none of us, myself included, likes feeling inferior to other people. Because we, we live in a society and a culture that tells us the more successful you are, the more accepted you are, and the better you are. And so when we see other people being successful, we start to harbor bitterness and animosity and anger towards them. And see, the reason for this is because it's, it's a natural human response to not like those who are better than us, who do things at a higher level than us, who other people like more than us. It's a natural thing for us to not like those people. And here's what John says in verse 13 in light. He says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So remember, he, he's talking to a group of Christians. He's, he's writing a letter to a church, to, to those who have placed their faith in Jesus as their Lord. So he's saying, hey, don't be surprised if the world hates you. No, what's it say? Don't be surprised that the world hates you. Christians, we, we, we got to understand something. Jesus promised that if the world hated him, it's going to hate us. And here's why. Because the, the world and people do not like feeling like they're living a life that is inferior. They don't like being told or feeling like the life they're living is wrong. They don't like looking at the righteous acts of other people, realizing that that's how they should be acting. And as a result of that, they begin to hate other people. People, because here's, here's something, if, if you took a second to think about it, we all gravitate to people that are like us. If you think about your friend groups, my guess is most of your friends are people that are like you. People that have the same passions, the same wants, the same desires. Because we as, as people, and I see some heads shaking no, but if you think about it, we all want to feel accepted. We all want to feel like we belong. We all want to feel like we fit in. And what better way to make sure that happens than surrounding ourselves with people that are like us? See, this is why the church is such a beautiful thing is it can take all kinds of different people, different walks, different ethnicities, different makeups, different economic backgrounds, and every single one of those things doesn't matter because we're all united under the person of Jesus. But the reality for us is, as, as individuals, as people, we want to be around people who are like us. Because we want to feel like there's a place that we fit in. And so when the world, the outside world, looks at Christians and sees that we're living a certain way, and they begin to have this guilt conscience that they should be living that way, they're not going to like us. And so there's two things that I want us to consider as, as we're thinking about this. First of all, are, are you a person that hates other people because they do things better than you? Are you the type of person that gets jealous of other people? Are you the type of person that harbors animosity or bitterness because someone else seems to be more, more successful or, or more well-liked? Or are you a person that, that maybe, maybe that's not you, but are you a person that's afraid to step out in the world because you don't want to be hated? And so what you do is, is you want to do whatever you can to try to fit in, try to blend in, to try to just to go with the crowd and, and do the easy thing because you don't want to be hated. See, Jesus' promise is we will be hated. And so we need to begin to think about this because here's, here's what, what John says. He takes it even a step further. He says in verse 14, look there with me. He says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in 
death. John's, John's saying, hey, the world's going to hate you, but not just that, Christian. There's a higher calling for you and for me. And so I want to read it again. It says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. What John is suggesting here is that, that loving other people is a matter of life and death. So let that sit in for a second, because I, my, my guess is you did not walk in here tonight thinking that the way you love other people is a matter of life and death. And, and here's what John is suggesting. Here's what John is telling you and telling me, so don't miss this. Every single one of us in this room, we are going to die a physical death. Agreed? You guys on board with that, right? Every single person here is going to die a physical death. The death and life that John is talking about is spiritual death and spiritual life. None of us in this room have a choice in the physical death. Every single one of us has a choice in the spiritual death. And what John is saying is that those who are spiritually alive, those who have spiritual vitality and life and breath in them, are the ones who love the brothers and sisters. He's saying that if we do not have love for those around us, and I want to make this clear, not just for those that are like us, not just for those who like us, not just for those that we like. If we have love for everybody, John is saying that we have spiritual life. But then again, he takes it even a step further in verse 15. Look there, he says this. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So maybe for you, when I, when I started this off in the beginning, talking about love, indifference, hatred, and murder, like, oh, well, I'm good on the murder part. Like, <laughs> haven't done that, right? Not yet. Just kidding, right? Not at all, right? Hopefully that's not going to be any of us, right? But what we understand is that the standard and call of a Christian is so much higher than we think because Jesus is the standard. So what, what John is saying here is everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, Think about that for a second. Are you a person that's harboring hatred in your heart towards somebody? Because if you are, John is saying you and I are murderers. Here's how one commentator put it when I was reading this. He says this, the question is not so much what did you do, but what did you want to do? What would you have done if you had been at liberty to do as you pleased? This is why Jesus equates hatred with murder. And so I want you to think about that for a second. It's not about what we do. It's what we'd want to do. And we, we've got to understand that when it comes to Jesus, he is far more concerned with our heart. Our outward actions are a reflection of our heart. And so I, I want you to think about this, because this, this is an awkward thing to think about. And I, I thought about it as I was, I was preparing this, is if you could, not saying do it, right? But if you could get away with murder... There was no penalty, nothing was going to happen to you, no consequence. How many of us would actually consider it based on the hatred we have towards people? Because the reality is most people, the things that we don't do are because we live in a fear of getting in trouble. We live in a fear of the consequences. So what if there were no consequences? What if there was nothing to worry? I'm not just... Murder's one crazy thing, right? Because hopefully we all value human life for what it is, human life. But think about everything else. That, that kid at school you don't like. If you knew you wouldn't get in trouble, would you just go punch him in the face? Probably. I would have when I was in high school. Just being honest, right? So I, let, let's just think about this for a second. If it's what we'd want to do that matters, not what we actually do We've got to think a lot more about that. 
Because here's, here's the reality for you and me is Jesus knows what is on your heart and what is in your heart. And so you can put on whatever facade you want for your friends, for your parents, for those at school, for your teachers, for your coaches. You can fool every single person you've ever met. You can even fool yourself. I can put on whatever look I want. I can come up here and, and quote the Bible all day long. I could get in my car and listen to worship songs all I want. But if my heart is full of hatred and bitterness and envy and jealousy, you know who's not going to be impressed with anything I've done? God. Hopefully some of you. So the question is not what do we do, but what do we want to do? Because loving those around us comes from a want to. Because people are hard to love. And so as we think about this, there's another way that I want us to, to understand this. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Fair enough. Do we agree? Probably shouldn't murder, right? All right, cool. We're all on board. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. In this verse, you, we've got Jesus puts being angry with somebody and murdering somebody on the same plane. Both of those make us liable to judgment. And so it's not what we do that matters, it's what's in our heart. Because we've got to understand, as, as you get older and hopefully as, as you grow in faith, if you're not a Christian, I, I hope and pray that you, you become one someday, but those of you that consider yourselves Christians in there, we have to understand Jesus is always calling us to something deeper and something greater. Jesus is not impressed with where we're at. He rose from the dead. Like, that's kind of impressive. Like, we've got nothing on that. Let's just be honest. Like, we've got nothing. As, as one of those songs saying, we've got nothing to offer. But the beauty of it is, is Jesus wants more for you. And so Jesus is always going to call you and to call me into something deeper that is going to make us a better person that is ultimately going to form us to be more like him. That is the goal of a Christian. The goal is not to murder. Yes, that's part of it. But the ultimate goal is to become like Jesus. Here's how Warren Wearsby said it. says, the fact that you have never actually murdered anyone should not make you proud or complacent. Have you ever harbored hatred in your heart? Murder's not the standard. That, that's a pretty low standard. Loving people is the standard. Because Jesus is the standard. And loving us, loving you, loving me, loving every single person to ever step foot on this earth is what Jesus did. Look at verse 16 with me. It says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Just let that verse sink in for a second. By this we know love that Jesus laid down his life for us. I want us to, to sit in that laid down his life part for a second. Because some people tell you that Jesus had his life taken from him. Sometimes the, the phrase is used that Jesus was murdered. Those can be true to an extent, but Jesus himself said, nobody takes my life from me, I lay it down on my own accord. Think about what, what this is saying. Jesus showed his love for you and that he willingly, don't miss this, he willingly went to the cross for you. He willingly went to the cross for me. If I can be honest, sometimes I don't even willingly want to go to the store to get ice cream for Carissa when she wants ice cream. <laughs> And ice cream is delicious. 
Like, I just want to sit on the couch and chill. And but she's like, I want ice cream. There's times like, eh, can we door dash it? Like, I don't want to go anywhere, right? Like, that's the extent of, of my love sometimes. Because I don't even want to go to the store to get something that I'm going to enjoy because I'm too lazy, right? Maybe for you, like, maybe your friend asks you, hey, can, can I, you know, can we go to your car? I, I forgot something. You're like, no, can I get a ride? No, man, where's my gas money, right? Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of extent to our love for people. Don't, don't miss Jesus' love. He laid down his life. There is nothing more to give than your life. And Jesus laid down his life for you and for me despite our dishonoring him, despite our neglect of him, despite our hatred of him, despite our unbelief of him, Jesus knew the life you were going to live, and he still died for you anyways. Jesus knew the life that I was going to live, and he died for me anyways. That's what love looks like. So John says, as Jesus laid down his life for us, what are we supposed to do? What's it say? So read it. It's in your Bibles. Verse 16, the end. What's it say? Y'all got Bibles, you just say it out loud, it's okay. We ought to what? Thank you. Lay down our lives for our brothers. The call of the Christian is to be willing to do what Jesus did for us. Now, let's, let's be honest here. I, I want to you know, break the tension a little bit there's a really good chance you're never going to have to willingly give up your life for somebody. All right, like let's, maybe, maybe it'll happen, most likely probably not. But here, here's what I can absolutely tell you love is gonna require of you. And what I have experienced in my life, what love requires of me, and that's laying down our pride. See, our, our pride is what keeps us from making amends with people. Our pride is what keeps us from wanting to apologize. Our pride is what keeps us from asking for forgiveness. See, I, I can show my wife I love her all I want by, by you know, getting all the flowers, getting her the best gifts, all those things. You know what my wife wants more than anything most times? For me to say I'm sorry. Jesus too, yes. Like if, if I apologized every time I did something stupid, which is a lot, Carissa would be very happy if I actually apologized before her needing to ask me to apologize. You know what keeps me from wanting to apologize? Not Jesus, pride, right? Uh, all right, all right, yeah, pride, right? So just think about it for a second. For you, love has to cost us something. So what is it in your life that you're not willing to lay down for those around you? Who is it in your life that you need to do a better job loving, and maybe for you that means simply apologizing? Because here, here's something that we need to understand about ourselves as people and the change that happens when we become people that follow Jesus. We just quote, self-preservation is the first law of physical life, but self-sacrifice is the first law of spiritual life. Our natural tendency as people is to try to protect and preserve ourselves. So as we talked about in the beginning, that is why some of us are very hesitant to love because we don't want to get hurt, we don't want to give something up. But the number one sign of us being people that are spiritually alive in Jesus is self-sacrifice, is being willing to give up of ourselves. An old person said it this way, the sort of love exemplified in Christ's death is love which expends itself in the interests of others. That we are willing to give up things of ourself, our desires, our wants, our needs, our pursuits, our passions, 
for the sake of others. If you've never read it before, I would encourage you to just read Philippians 2. It's this beautiful song, this beautiful hymn about who Jesus is and what he did. That he willingly laid down his life. He got off his throne in heaven to come to earth, to take the form of a man, to die a death, not just a death, but death on the cross for you and for me. Who in their right mind leaves all that behind, sacrifices everything for a world that might not even appreciate it? A God that loves you and desires to be in relationship with you. That's who. He expended himself for the benefits of others. So John goes on to say in verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? This is indifference. Seeing a need around us and turning our back on it. Closing our eyes to it, closing our heart. And what John is saying is, if God's love really abides in us, if we really love God, if we see somebody's need, we're going to meet it. This is why he says in verse 18, look there. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Love is always action driven. We can't look at the life of Jesus and not come to the conclusion that love is always expressed in action. I want to finish up by, by reading a familiar story. For some of you, um, if, if you haven't heard the story, you've heard the phrase Good Samaritan. Uh, but here's what Jesus says in Luke 10, verses 30 to 37, about what it looks like for us to actually love in action. Here's what he says. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So Jesus asked, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The man said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. And what we got to understand in this passage is the one that actually helped was a cultural and racial enemy. That they absolutely despised each other. A Samaritan and a Jew hated each other. Jews would not even step foot in the town of Samaria. And so what Jesus is highlighting here for you and for me is that it was the, the perceived enemy was the one who showed love and compassion. And notice who was indifferent. Notice who just walked on by. The fellow Jew and a priest. A friend and a believer. And so Jesus makes it so very clear for us that the way of Jesus is the way of love. And it's a very, very slippery slope going from indifference to hatred and to murder. Indifference will lead to hatred. And hatred, as we've seen tonight in this passage, hatred of our brother is murder. And so what I want to ask you tonight is what would it look like for you and for me to love not just in word, but in deed and in truth? And so I, I want to give you a, a couple of scenarios that, that might possibly be an opportunity for you to step in to a situation and offer love. 
Because it's simply that the best way to love people in your life is to simply enter into their life and meet their needs. You have a friend that's having a bad day, sit there and listen. Take them the favorite drink from Dutch. Give them a hug. Let them cry on your shoulder. That's what it looks like to love our friends. You see that kid at school that's getting bullied. What it looks like to love is to step in, to go stand up for them, to let them know that you see them, that you care. There's that person that's sitting by themselves at school. What's it look like to love them? To go sit with them, to go talk to them, to let them know that they are known and they are seen and they are valued. Person drops their books. If you guys even have books anymore, I don't even know, right? Pick them up for them. Someone drops their groceries in the store. Pick them up for them. See an old lady pushing a grocery cart? Push the grocery cart for her, help them put them away. These are all very small ways that we can show love to people around us. You see someone who needs clothes on the streets, give them clothes. See someone who needs food, give them food. See someone that just needs someone to acknowledge them, acknowledge them. You know there's something you need to forgive, forgive them. If you know there's something that you need to apologize to, apologize. If there's a friendship that needs to be mended, mend it. If there's somebody you haven't talked to because of some stupid beef you have, fix it. Like, loving people is not really that hard in practice if we're willing to die to ourselves. And so what I want you to think about tonight is what would it mean for you to love others? What would that look like for you and your friends, in your families, at school, in your small groups? Who's someone in your life that you can tangibly show love to this week? Because if we truly grasp and understand the love Jesus has for us, our response, as John says, is we've got to love other people in return. And so my hope for you and for me is that we would love people the way that we desire to be loved that we would value people the way we desire to be valued, that we would treat people the way we desire to be treated, and we would just be the people that Jesus is calling us to be. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for your son. Father, I thank you for the cross. Father God, that you have set the example for us. Lord Jesus, that you don't just talk a talk. Father, you walked the walk that you walked the road to Calvary carrying your own cross, willingly laying down your life for me and for us. So Lord, tonight I pray that you would instill in our hearts a desire and a passion, Father, to love others the way you've loved us. King Jesus, that we'd be willing to give of ourselves for the sake of those around us to the glory of your great name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.